Okay, we're on page 516 talking about the class of fires and therefore the class of fire suppression systems. So class A basically means, you know, you got some wood or paper or something like that's on fire. And so it, those are fairly easy to get rid of. A class B means you have some sort of a combustible liquid like gasoline or something like that, oil or something, solvents. And those are kind of different because if you don't, you can't just like put water on them. That, that's not going to work. So typically what you have to do is you have to, you can't lower, so wood, I can just lower the temperature of the wood. How do you do that? Well, just putting water on it. Okay, that lowers the, temper, the, the ignition temperature. I can't do that with gasoline. Pouring water on gasoline doesn't change its flash point. It just makes the gas go everywhere. So I have to use something that, a chemical like carbon dioxide, halon, or something, a dry chemical or something that are specifically designed for class Bs. Class C fire is like, okay, it's a fire, but it's it's caused by some electrical component, okay? Now, so I have a, a, a toaster, okay, that caught on fire. Do I get out the sprinkler hose and, and the toaster's still plugged in and turned on? Do I get out the garden hose and, and spray water on it? Uh, no, I'll probably get electrocuted, right? Okay, so class C fires are different because you cannot use water and therefore you have to use, you know, carbon dioxide and dry chemical and blah, 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 blah. Have you kind of sort of figured out if you get a class C, you know, the dry chemical, carbon dioxide, it'll actually work for a C, a B, and an A, right? I don't need to have like three fire extinguishers, right? Okay. Class D were combustible metals. Like this is not going to happen, but you know, magnesium is a metal that actually burn. And those basically you have no choice. Basically, the way you put out a magnesium fire is you dump sand on it, okay? That's how it's done. You basically have to smother it. Uh, and, of course, that's very, very specialized, and we don't have to worry about that. And in other areas of the world, not necessarily in here, we have a, a thing called a Class K fire. And this is basically combustible cooking oil. Um, and they're, they're separate because they require separate kind of thing. One of the things you can do... Um, I don't know. We just don't have that in our world, so I don't really know that much about it. But basically, it's the same thing. You could do a fine water mist to kind of tamp it down and to use dry chemical or, or CO2 kind of a thing. Cool. Um, so let's talk about the, the dry chemical thing. Um, dry chemical is just basically spraying a powder. You know, it's kind of sort, kind of, sort of liquid, and then it hits it and kind of goes into a little powder. Poof. Okay, cool. Um, since I'm directing that at something, I'm not really at danger much because I'm standing with the fire extinguisher in my hand, right? With a, a class C fire extinguisher. But what if I had a halon system in a room and the halon dumped? You better the heck get out of that room and close the door behind you because the purpose of the halon system is to take out all the oxygen. The purpose of the CO2 is to take out all the oxygen. Well, I don't know about you guys, but I need oxygen, okay? So I can't be in the same room as one of those things goes off. I mean, a handheld one, I don't have to worry about too much, but one of those you know, gargantuan systems like in a server room that dumps CO2 or halon, you, you really can't have anybody in there, okay? Just saying. All right. So uh, portable, manual, automatic, you know, right? You could have a handheld guy, you know, manually operated where you hit the switch, same old, same old. Wet pipe versus dry pipe, we talked about all that. Okay, gaseous emission systems. Yeah, like I ate a bunch of beans. Uh, so, halon gas, uh, again, that used to be really big, now it's not. Uh, what, what they want is something that's going to be what's called a clean agent. Something that if they, if they dump into the room, you don't have to go back and clean up afterwards, right? So, CO2 is a fantastic one. Because if they dump CO2 into the room to suppress the thing, the fire, I don't have to go back with a vacuum cleaner or, you know, a broom or something and, and, and clean up everywhere because it's just a gas that went away, right? So no residue is the kind of the key to that thing. And CO2 is fantastic, but for God's sake, you better not be in the room. I mean, if you got hit in the head and you're unconscious and you hit the floor and they dump the CO2, you're probably going to die. Okay. On page 519, they talk about failure of utilities. So the power goes out kind of a thing. So first, let's talk about heating, ventilation, and air conditioning, HVAC. Heating, ventilation, and air conditioning, HVAC. Um, talking about the things that can happen. So if I'm building, again, I'm building a server room, and I need to deal with uh, HVAC 
so there's a couple things that has to happen. One is there's a, a, a possibility of static. Now, you know what I'm talking about. You know, you walk across the carpet and you touch something and you go pow. You know, static electricity. That can be really bad to an awful lot of computer equipment. So you have to maintain an environment that is not conducive to electrostatic discharge. Okay. And it's done with controlling humidity. Now you might think, well, wait, is it, do I take humidity out of the air or do I put humidity into the air? Well, to tell you the truth, in our part of the country, um, there's not, well, uh, forget that. Yes. <laughs> There's a range of humidity, okay? And I'm making some of this up because I really don't know. But somewhere like between 25 and 80% is the range they want the humidity and they don't want too much humidity and certainly not condensing. You know, they don't want water dripping down the walls. And they don't want too little humidity. So the HVAC systems that are designed for computer rooms are designed to keep you within that range between the two numbers because outside the two, the two numbers, it's gonna if it's too much, it's going to, you know, drip and, and cause problems. If it's too little, you're going to have electro, electrostatic discharge. Okay. <clears throat> so there's a cool term here called trivial electrification. Basically talks about the exchange of electrons between two materials when they make contact, resulting in one octave, blah, 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 blah. Bottom line is that, yes, you can, uh, you can actually end up with... Uh, the, we had to deal with this in the mechanical world. Um, you know, well, like, I don't know, I'm having a copper pipe and a steel pipe, and I, I put the two, two pieces of the pipes together. Uh, yeah, that could cause a problem because basically it's sort of like a little battery in there. The electrons move from the, you know, the copper to the steel back and forth. It's kind of weird. Anyway, um, so the next thing to talk about, of course, is the, the operating temperatures. For a server room, typically, uh, the optimum server room temperature is between 70 and 74 degrees Fahrenheit. That's a little chilly for most people. Uh, I will let you know that uh, in modern times, when people are very, very concerned about carbon footprints and, and how much money it takes for the electrical system to operate the air conditioning, you know, it costs money, right? A lot of companies let this go a lot higher than that. I mean, a lot higher than the recommended. But I'm just saying if you're designing one, 70 to 74 is supposed to be kind of cool in there. Okay, humidity and static electricity, yeah. Um, so static electricity is all about the, the voltage. Now, people get the wrong idea. Voltage and amperage are two separate things. Voltage is basically, okay, here's a, a crazy way of thinking about voltage. Voltage is the distance between two areas that, that where a spark is gonna fly, okay? If the, if, the thing, if, you, if the spark flies when they're that far apart, then that's not very much voltage. But if a spark can jump that far, that's an awful lot of voltage. And if a spark can jump that far, that's a heck of a lot of voltage. Okay, so voltage is sort of, I know this is a crazy analogy, but so electrical engineers don't 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 fuss at me. But voltage is could be could be measured as a distance. Okay. Amperage, on the other hand, is how much current, how much, how much oomph is in there. Okay? So typically uh, electrostatic discharge doesn't have hardly any amps at all, which is why you don't die when you walk across the carpet and, and touch something and it goes pow. I mean, it might not feel good on your finger, but you don't clutch your chest and go, oh, you know, the big one and, and uh, end up with a heart attack because the amperage is not very high. So volt and amps together. Okay. Um, so about 1500 volts is where things really, really go bad. I mean, if, if you get a 1500 volt discharge onto a computer, I'm saying there's probably not any of the computers around here that could handle that. And if you go m higher than that, I mean, you're, if you're talking about instant death uh, of all computer equipment. Um, I get, um, I keep my, my hard drives. So I have a, a, an extra hard drive here and I, don't, I want to protect it from electrostatic discharge. So I get an electro, electrostatic discharge package, a, a bag. So this is the bag that I use. It looks like a Ziploc bag, but it's designed specifically for keeping down electrical discharge. So I put it in here, fold it all up, close the thing up. Now think about this. So now I've got this guy, he's, he's now airtight. So 
there's no smoke can get in here. There's no water that can get in here. There's no electrical that can get in here. If I had a fire in the house and practically everything got smoke damage, my hard drive would not have smoke damage, would it? Because it's airtight inside this cool little plastic bag. Cool? Okay. All right. So ventilation shafts. Of course, that's kind of dumb, but you know, I have seen designs in 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 my time with the military, where um, you had a a, a a heating ductwork, or they actually put bars in it to keep critters, mostly critters, but uh, keep humans out as well. Again, of course, Hollywood always has the you know the good the good guys and the bad guys crawling through the ventilation system. That that's not really practical. Okay, power management and grounding, uh, or conditioning, rather, on page 521. So, grounding. Um, in your kitchen, if you have a halfway modern house, in your kitchen, in your bathroom, there's a, a thing called a, a, a ground fault circuit interrupter, a GFCI. And what this basically means is, if you accidentally dropped the toaster into a sink of water while the toaster was still plugged in, it would detect that there's a fault there, and... Break, hit the breaker so you don't get electrocuted. It's to protect you from dropping your hair dryer into the into the tub while you're somebody's in the tub, that kind of stuff. So any place where there's water and electrical, you're supposed to have a, a CGFI, a GFCI. Uh, mine include the outside. You know, I have plugs on the outside of my house, the front and the back. And so like you plug a, a, a extension cord in and you decide to, you know, go out there and edge, you have an electrical edger and it's raining, well, you're right, you could get electrocuted, right? Kind of? Well, this is supposed to prevent that. So it's a special kind of, of fuse, so to speak. it's an entire system, but I'm simplifying. It's a special type of fuse box scenario where it doesn't trip on the overload, like the amount of current going through it is, has exceeded some comp threshold, therefore I need to shut it down. It does it because it's a ground fault, which means you've cross-circuited something. Okay, an uninterrupted power supply on page 490. There's lots of different ways you can do this. Now, some of these examples here are, are kind of weird, so just kind of bear with me because some of them are kind of old. Um, but there are five major types of UPSs, under uninterrupted power supply, UPS. A standby type. Now. Standby basically means it is offline. There ain't nothing going on until something happens, and then you, you it comes on. It fires up and does its thing. So a standby power. Um, those typically don't really exist now because we've, we've figured out a, a much, much better way. But in the old days, that's how it did. You had a, a transfer switch. The switch could be automatic. I mean, it doesn't have to be a manual switch. But basically, nothing's going on. The system is basically doing you're sitting there idle until the power goes out and then all of a sudden it jumps into life. A ferro resonant one, which is the one on the bottom, is slightly different. It's running 24 seven. It runs all the time and just switch. So when a power uh, outage occurs, it's switching time is a lot faster, right? Because it's, it's already on, it's already running. And it has this thing basically called the flywheel effect, which basically means that uh, there's kind of like stored up energy uh, sort of like you know how a flywheel will store up energy. You know, you spin a flywheel up, and then you take the take the motor off the flywheel, and it continues to run. Well, that's how this. It's not mechanical, but from an electrical point of view, that's how this does it. You know, you start current going, and then when the power goes out, it the current still continues to go for a while. So not only is the switchover faster, it actually can match the uh, in the waveform of the power. You know, so. Quicker in in switching over to a different system. A line interactive. Um, basically, this is one where um, it's there's no switching at all. It just basically always runs. In other words, it doesn't wait for a switch. All electric electricity goes through the system and then comes out of the system and keeps going. Those are kind of expensive and kind of, to tell you the truth, you know, heat up a lot and you know I don't see that many of those either. We're coming up on the 15 minute mark. Dog, got it.